Are you suffering from social anxiety and mental health issues? If you are, it's hardly surprising. I don't even mean just within the context of a global pandemic and the obvious political fissures that are emerging, but perhaps our systems even beyond current events are designed to engender and exacerbate mental illness. Do you feel socially anxious right now? Are you concerned about how to have interactions where you can only see 50% of the face? Are you worried about having a total lack of connection? Do you feel somehow that you're not nurtured within, that you're not good enough, that you're worthless, that this is a difficult world to live in, that out there somewhere people are living a better life than you, that you've somehow missed out on something crucial, vital and integral to the experience of being human? Well, this is not a new idea. Religions are founded, books are written, and I don't just mean modern self-help books such as the ones that I've written. Great masterpieces of literature are constructed on this basis that we have become a lost species. That The problem of mental health is not an individual one, but a social and cultural one. The late great Mark Fisher wrote in his book Capitalist Realism, link in the description, that mental health problems are created by the alienation, dissatisfaction and disconnection of the modern world. Sebastian Junger, I think it's his name in his book Tribe, says that we couldn't, if we were looking to design a society to create mental health problems, we couldn't do any better than what we've currently done. A culture that makes people feel alienated, alone, worthless. We tend to compare ourselves to one another. In short, if you want to be mentally healthy, you're going to have to find a way of severing yourself from the grid, from the matrix of culture that pumps you full of negative information. Now, you know me, I'm not an out there conspiracy theorist whilst I am sympathetic and open to many of the ideas outside of the mainstream that get a lot of traction. I think that the problem is simply that we prioritise so strongly economic uh, the economic advantages of the already economically advantaged that it biases and warps the rest of culture in a direction that means that most people to some degree suffer. And I say this as a person very, very much aware of my privilege, the various lotteries that I may have won culturally, economically, and, you know, some would argue sort of, uh, you know, socially through the time I'm born, the gender I have and the, the race that I am. But the mental health problem is one that infects all of us. It probably affects you more if you do not have any economic facility with which to remedy it. But like, you know, across my life, I've known enough people now that are like sometimes like properly world famous people that you'd think would be right as rain or somehow reveling in the spoils of our society that are just desperate, broken and alone. And the solution for them, and you know me, because I'd have to include myself in that to a degree, is the same as the solution for you. To find connections that are outside the mediated space of our capitalist culture. What I mean is purpose, a personal purpose. What is the purpose of your life right now? What is the thing that is motivating and driving you? How I would personally answer that question is, I want to have a connection with reality. I want to stand in reality, not in the concepts, constructions and inflections of a culture that sees me primarily as a consumer and an agent of consumerism. I recognise that practically I am the father in a family. I have an obligation to my partner and to our children. I have all sorts of economic responsibilities that I have to fulfil without being sucked into the very system that I am here critiquing. My purpose more broadly is to ensure that on a daily basis I am of service and use to other people, people from whom I can't get anything in return except that glow of goodwill that you get when you know that you've helped another person. I'm connected to a tribe of people that have the same purpose in me, in my, as me. In my case that's around abstinence, and connecting to a higher power, but all of us can have that. In short, and the reason that I mentioned Sebastian Junger is because he strongly believes that part of the solution to our problem is in emulating and recreating the conditions for which we are evolved. We are evolved to be tribal animals. If you're living a lonely, atomized life, 
defined entirely by economic criteria, you'll need to meet certain targets to pay certain bills to stop yourself from going under, then you, as he says in his book, are as detached from reality as it's possible to be. If you have no connection to nature, if your own survival is mediated again through economic structures that seem abstract to you, if you're, you're paid, you, li you live in a house, you're ordering everything online, what have we made ourselves? We're just becoming like an avenue, a junction for this system. Like the systems that are meant to serve us have put, have submitted us, subjugated us into their service. For your social anxiety, for your mental being, for you to reclaim some kind of mental health, some nutrition, some connection, you are going to have to create and replicate organic and natural systems outside of the culture in the way that I in the way I described you're going to need prayer and meditation you're going to need connection to like-minded people you're going to need a connection to nature any one of those things might be challenging for you in a way that I'm not considering because I don't understand your likely economic or medical realities because I'm aware I'm coming at you from a time of great uh, at a time of great suffering the simple truth is this <clears throat> The spiritual life cannot be seen as sundry, secondary, uh, an ancillary add-on. This is the main course. The main course is your connection to reality or your connection to God. Use whatever word you, uh, you know, don't jar with you, don't wind you up. If you don't have that connection, if your well-being is entirely attached to, to things that are beyond your control, man, that's a life of suffering. I know this because I've been there. But check this out as a beautiful a metaphorical piece of writing from the great Herman Melville from his masterpiece Moby Dick. I like this piece of writing because it's embedded with archetypal information that through his genius he accessed. For those of you who don't know, Moby Dick takes place on a whaling ship, like they're out looking for this whale, Moby Dick, who's obviously under the surface of the water and therefore represents the monster under the water, which all of us personally identify with because all of us have within us primal drives such as our sexuality and our drives to survive, which include the need to like, you know, hunt and kill, for example, and that we have by and large, unless we have some means of connecting with them, lost that connection and therefore we live with a monster under the sea of ourselves. This is how Melville describes that situation. Check it out. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide underwater, unapparent for the most part and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tints of azure. Consider also the devilish brilliance and beauty of many of its most remorseless tribes as the dainty embellished shape of many species of sharks. Consider once more the universal cannibalism of the sea, all whose creatures prey upon each other, carrying on eternal war since the world began. Consider all this and then turn to this green, gentle and most docile earth. Consider them both, the sea and the land. And do you not find a strange analogy to something in yourself? For as this appalling ocean surrounds the verdant land, so in the soul of man there lies one insular Tahiti, full of peace and joy, but encompassed by all the horrors of the half-known life. God keep thee, push not off from that isle, thou canst never return. Melville makes the case of staying on the terra firma of the acknowledged psyche, the terrain that you know, the person that you know yourself to be, not venturing off into the oceans of the possible, not relinquishing the ego, not letting go. Now there's an obvious counterpoint to that. There's a clear argument for exploring these territories. In fact, for me, the world of prayer and meditation, potentially psychedelic investigation, is all about discovering and harnessing these latent powers. But as that beautiful piece of writing demonstrates this should be done with some degree of caution. There's no doubt that you would feel anxious at a time like this, in a place like this, in a space like this, with a creed like this, in a world like this, designed to keep you trapped, immobilised, spending, even under the most ludicrous conditions, where the world itself is calling out to us to awaken, and the systems we have designed, the man-made manacles of our social and economic systems, endeavour to keep us in chains. Try to find your own way back home. Look for people that are on the same path as you awakened. Know that as these structures were created, alternative structures may yet be created. And from this peculiarly apocalyptic time, there may yet be 
a cultural awakening because you are not suffering from social anxiety and mental illness alone. You are suffering as part of an epidemic, an epidemic induced by willful ignorance.